We're going to cover a lot of material today, but I'm going to try to focus on the key points that I think are most important for you to understand and take away. The presentation is a global presentation, so it doesn't take into consideration just one geography, but rather what is happening with disruptive innovation globally uh, in every major market. Um, do we translate and then proceed, or how, how do we do this, Martha? It's happening as we speak. Yeah. As we speak. That's excellent. Okay, very good. So let's get started. Um, there are four questions that we're going to address today. We're going to be looking at uh, digital cities in a very different way than what we are accustomed to. We don't use the term smart city, we use the term digital city. And what we really mean by that is that cities are not just uh, run by governments or by planning organizations, but they are live centers of commerce, where you have a lot of private corporations that are developing their markets within cities to sell goods and services directly to the citizens. As an example of that, uh, the top five um, Silicon Valley technology companies spend nearly 70% of their total R&D budget on products and services delivered into the city markets. So typically when we think of smart cities, we separate out the government and selling to the government and the planning part of that with what actually happens on the commercial side inside of the city, especially in a free market system uh, that we have, for example, not just in the United States, but also developing in China. So when we say digital cities, what we really mean by that is the goods and services and the markets that we can see and visualize within each of the, of the city, not just the infrastructure and the government and planning function. The second question we're going to talk about is uh, how should I think about disruptive technology? If I were trying to develop a framework for how disruptive technology is going to change my world, how do I really understand what that means? So we're going to talk a little bit about a definition of disruptive technology and we're going to show you some real world examples of it. We're also then going to show technology case examples of new disruptive technology changing the way business models operate for a number of companies. So as an example of that, um, there's a new emerging term called continuously connected value chain. And we're going to do an illustration of what BMW is doing essentially to connect all of the elements from the customer to the partner to the manufacturing process in the design and execution of um, uh, its car manufacturing. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about data acquisition and some of the current trends. Um, it's a little bit mind-boggling because there is so much information now being garnered from not just phones but also from fixed locations in cities about us and about what we do, about what we buy, where we go, and how we even think about um, you know, our transactions. I'm also going to be talking about a really major new approach that we're taking in our research effort over in the, my program, Disruptive Technology and Digital Cities program. It's called a, it's a new digital city visual modeling platform. Not the best of terms, but that's the best we could come up with as engineers. Visual modeling platform. And essentially what it is, is taking a, a look at a city visually not just from the perspective of buildings and infrastructure and traffic movement, but also in terms of layering on the commercial market information. So we'll see, for example, how transactions actually occur on credit cards and other information as it moves through the city and what the relationship is to, for example, a building that's located nearby. Then we're going to show you that the model uh, of goal um, really is to project forward. So if I want to change the way my city looks, if I want to change where I put a building, how I want to think about it from a, a market point of view, you'll be able to literally drop the building as an object into the city model and then see what the impact is in the surrounding area and also to the building itself. So we have uh, a machine intelligence, a professor who's running the machine intelligence uh, 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 department at Stanford, but we also have the cooperation of seven major companies that are engaged with the program. And so we're getting data from Visa International, Cushman Wakefield, which is a rather large um, American real estate company, uh, also Microsoft, and Prologis, which is a warehousing logistics uh, company. So the private companies are cooperating with us to give us the data sets necessary to put into the model and be able to visualize. 
exactly what will happen in a city. It's the first time we've made an attempt to put the economy of a city in terms of an online visual model. We call that crossing the data layers. So uh, these are the four areas. We talked a little bit about the definition of what a digital city is. Our point of view is it's not simply one thing, it's a combination of data layers. Commercial data layers of private companies that are engaging in commerce, trading information, um, profiling data, social media, companies like Apple that sell the data to other companies. And in addition to that, infrastructure, roads, transportation, the traditional smart city model. So we're thinking about this in terms of a much broader based look at how a city functions and also how the welfare of the people can be managed through all this. Um, one of the things that's really interesting when you take a look at cities in general is that if you look at the trends, th this is like a visualization of a city, there is very heavy concentration of GDP growth correlated with population. So for example, in the city of London, uh, for every point that that city represents in total population, 11% of total UK population, there's almost a two to one ratio in growth in GDP. And it's consistent among 186 different um, uh, city megacities throughout the world. So this is an example of our visual modeling platform um, that I was just talking about, where you see the visualization of the buildings and other things, but we begin to layer onto that, not just to the left, the government agency and planning function, but the functions on the right, including everything about income, net worth, for example, demand uh, for uh, home ownership, credit lines, financial transactions. So we are beginning to see that there are multiple layers of interaction uh, with consumers and, and with also uh, the government, but also with the free commercial markets. All right, this is a, a McKinsey study. We just um, are about to update this, but uh, it's phenomenal how much uh, the city contributes to international growth and GDP. And in fact, you could make the argument in many countries, and including this one, that it is the city GDP growth that actually is supporting the rest of the country. So when you look at the mega centers, for example, New York or Baltimore, Corridor, um, and Boston, and you look at the uh, West Coast, Los Angeles and um, San Diego and so forth, maybe Chicago in the uh, Midwest, but the key point of all this is, is that is where the majority of economic growth is taking place. So the reasons are uh, we have all the commerce centered there. We have the market exchange companies that are able to finance uh, businesses. But we also have the population centers uh, that have high density networks where data can be exchanged very easily in a very small geographical area. And so this creates a huge amount of opportunity as we start to look at this uh, in terms of uh, how we actually develop disruptive technology. But I think the key point here is that if you look at disruptive technology in general, it is targeted primarily at urban centers. If it ends up being elsewhere, it is because uh, that's an incremental market, not a primary objective of, of the company. So when you think about Apple or Facebook, or you think about SenseTime in China and some other companies, Alibaba, the focus is really on trying to look at products and services for urban centers. Um, and so it's a very different point of view than we normally think about when we, when we look at the term smart city. Okay, so how should I think about disruptive technology? Well, first of all, what is disruptive technology? From our point of view, disruptive technology not only is a technology that is innovative in the sense that it provides a new value proposition, but it also disturbs the economic business model of an entire industry or um, a series of companies. So an illustration of this is the iPhone. Uh, at the time that the iPhone was introduced uh, to the world, Nokia was the preeminent uh, cell phone company. Their value proposition was uh, to provide mobile communication, but the iPhone proposition was entirely different. It was to become a new type of phone platform that would allow people to use their own social media networks and entertainment uh, to essentially manage their lifestyle. And when the iPhone was introduced, uh, Nokia revenue began a precipitous decline, which is what usually happens because their entire business model had been disrupted by the technology. So when we think about disruptive technology, 
it has to fundamentally change an industry business model to be defined that way. We're not really interested in incremental innovation. We're interested in fundamental disruptive innovation. And so that model is how we think about uh, the world here in Silicon Valley. So um, when we go through and take a look at why disruptive technology has such a huge economic impact, we've developed what we call the quantum platform model. So essentially, think about it like a car engine where everything that is built on top of it um, is powered by the ability of the car to provide energy and power to move it forward. Okay? So we call it the rocket engine under the hood. So the primary platform of technology has uh, ambiguous computing power, which means almost unlimited ability to access computing power, unlimited free storage, which is now actually more than just free. Um, we can essentially store any amount of information um, pretty much anywhere in the cloud globally, which makes it possible for us to have a complete history or a background or a series of events and information that we haven't had previously. And the computing power not only allows us to access this, but also to process insight from this vast amount of information. When we combine that with software algorithms, um, algorithms are the ability to find the needle in the haystack, every needle in the haystack as the primary mission. So you've got this vast amount of information. How do we actually figure out what is relevant and what is insightful? That's what algorithms do. They're essentially mathematical equations that are now beginning to actually learn from each other. Some algorithms can create other algorithms. There's a company um, that Google purchased recently to do that. And so we have the ability to get the needle in the haystack, which we've never had before. Then imaging and sensor technology has also been advancing tremendously over the last couple of years, where we can literally print an antenna, a wireless antenna, right into our clothing or into virtually any kind of material. So not only can we have sensors and information embedded in different types of materials, but we can then hook it up to a network that makes it possible to relay the information. We're going to talk a little bit more about that um, as we get into the case examples. And then finally, the most significant piece of all this is certainly in cities, is this continuous network connection that's available. So we can not only connect people with their devices, but also other devices that have information about what is happening within the city and also with us, uh, since we're the center of the node. So this quantum platform that we have um, drives at a really fast rate, and it drives at an exponential rate of innovation. So by exponential, what we mean is there's a huge curve up, uh, unbelievably large curve up, where we are inventing more and more technology that is coming to market than has ever existed before in, in human history. Now, I have had a 30-year career um, working for tech companies. I started with Hewlett Packard. I worked for Apple and then also uh, finally for Xerox Park. And I have never seen anything quite like this before. The amount of pace of innovation and development globally is phenomenal. A lot of it's also being driven by China and what China is doing on, on the R&D side of it. So it's not like it's just one place that this is occurring. Um, the whole disruptive technology innovation cycle is everywhere around the globe. So as we start thinking about it, if anything is built like an application on top of this quantum platform, you're almost guaranteed um, a way to disrupt the industry business model. So this is the reason why. The growth is tremendous. The cost is very low. You get increased power every 18 months, free unlimited storage. It's almost like a human, uh, human ecosystem, if you think about it. It's a march toward a brain, the ability to figure out how to recall information, evaluate it, see things from our sensor information, and then also communicate that. And that's the march toward what I would call an intelligent machine or a sentient being at some point. So um, a little bit hard for us to actually comprehend. But um, the areas in green are waves of technology development that have occurred um, globally. And each wave has multiple waves that are connected to a node. What this really is, is a whole series of bets that are being done by venture capital and by outside investment, um, where you might have 10 different companies targeting a specific 
solution for one area and financed by a venture capital portfolio fund. This movement, if you look at the red line up, looks like a ski slope up, all the way up. So the exponential growth that is occurring with all of this investment is outpacing the dotted line, which is the line of our ability to actually manage it. So we're having a real hard time with the gap. The technology is moving faster than we can actually figure out how, what to do with it. And so we're losing a lot of control over where the technology is headed and how much it will disrupt our industries. So as part of that, I'm going to talk about another huge change that has occurred recently in the way that we finance technology development and innovation. And it is even bigger change than what is happening with the invention of technology. So if we look at it, um, these multiple waves do not approach what in a corporate R&D situation would be a simple linear product roadmap development. They are all over the place. So it's almost a simultaneous attack against one central problem by 10 different companies financed by 10 different venture capitalists. And then all of a sudden, um, the company gets funded and you have a solution and that solution happens to be another Google or another major like SenseTime in China. And so this whole notion about exponential curve is being financed by more dollars and investing um, in, in global terms than what is actually happening inside of the corporation. So total corporate R&D spend worldwide last year was $2 trillion. Of the total percentage that was actually spent on what I would call general scientific research or disruptive research, less than 10%. That's the lowest level of investment by corporate R&D in the last 50 years. And so only 200 billion total in corporate R&D that is invested in general scientific research versus applied research, which is the next version of our product that we're developing. On the outside of the company, the amount of investment on disruptive technology now exceeds the total dollar amount of investment inside the company. So it's created a world where we have approaching $300 billion in dedicated disruptive technology development compared to corporate spend of only $200 billion, uh, which is general scientific exploration. And so this change in the way that technology has invested is really um, creating two separate worlds. Uh, on the left, we have another planet with different uh, specifications, different behaviors, different attitudes about risk, with almost $300 million, uh, billion dollars worth of investment. And on the right, we have what I would call corporate Earth. Standard R&D that is being spent um, in a very different way with a very different risk profile. And there isn't much of a bridge between the two worlds. So we did a survey of some 400 CEOs. And what we discovered, uh, it was a survey about innovation. And what we discovered was that 94% um, of them were really unhappy about innovation occurring inside their company. But a more striking piece of data that came out of that was that their failure rate for new R&D projects was greater than 95%, which is actually higher failure rate for new R&D development than um, startup uh, rates of around 90%, which is extraordinary. And only 4% of the CEOs felt that they were getting any kind of return on investment. The number one issue coming out of the survey was they felt that they were completely unaware of where the technology was being developed, when it would come to hit them and uh, target their company, and what the impact would be. Completely unaware. And so they really are on a planet like this, and disruptive technology is occurring mightily over here, but they're not talking to each other. They don't even see each other. And so here in Silicon Valley, we have close to 10,000 startup companies between San Francisco and San Jose and East. And uh, the biggest complaint that I hear from 
CEOs of Fortune Group companies like Lockheed and Airbus and others is that they have no ability, they feel, to connect into this world. They don't even understand it. So it's like the French versus the English when they're cooking and doing culinary treats. You not only do not understand the language, but you cannot comprehend the subtlety of how the French cook, for example. Very different. Hopefully there are not too many English and French in here, but okay. <clears throat> so the way we think about this is that there, these two worlds have two different tribal cultures. On the right side, we have traditional corporate culture and is very much focused on short-term revenue and earnings goals. You all know this. You've heard this before. You've read articles about it. Um, and it's also extremely risk-averse and extremely methodical. We call it rhythm of the business is the standard approach to every process and everything that happens. And so it becomes very difficult for a corporation to understand the crazies that exist on the other planet. And they are crazy. They're crazy because they don't really care that much about risk. They have only a 1 in 10 chance of survival. 1 in 10 chance, 9 out of 10 fail. The leaders tend to be very obsessive about what they're trying to do with the technology development. So they're willing to take on very high risk. And they get paid in the form of equity that would far exceed anything they could ever earn inside of a company if they're successful. So that even the comp systems are different and the way they think about it are different. And this whole change the world attitude over on the left side really is a frightening uh, concept to um, the corporate R&D organizations that are on the right side here. So the two of them are very much um, different. They're so different, they're like uh, uh, almost completely opposed to each other in the way that they would approach. And so one of the reasons why corporations are having problems is because corporations operate on very different principles with very different leadership than, let's say, disruptive technology and startup uh, investment. Um, now, sometimes it's possible to overcome some of these issues enough to be able to develop a new innovation project. So we're going to talk a little bit about that with when we get to our BMW example in the next session. But it's very rare. And in fact, if you look at what is happening today with Apple, you can begin to see that we haven't really seen the kind of innovation drive for a new disruptive technology that we did in the first 10 years when Steve Jobs ran the company. We have an operating executive who is superb at being able to run the company, manage costs and reduce costs across all the different organization structure. But there is no leader in terms of the left side that has this crazy vision about where they want to take the company next. And the combination of the two is extremely important um, for disruptive innovation. If you just have one, it becomes almost impossible um, to get things moving forward in, in a direction, despite all the conflict that's involved. So what impact has it had here that you can actually see in Silicon Valley? Well, uh, we get a huge amount of, of venture capital, and now that number is closer to $100 billion as a result of um, you know, some uh, heavy-duty investments that were made recently um, in the economy. Maybe it's going to go down this year if we have a recession. We have over 157 companies that have a valuation of a billion dollars or more, which is kind of difficult uh, to try to understand, to conceive. More than 10,000 tech companies. Even though our wages are extremely high, we also have the worst um, disruption in terms of wealth versus um, the rest of the population. So we've got 1% of, uh, of the Valley's population and 99% and that are having difficulty just being able to um, afford a house here because it's so expensive. In fact, Joint Venture Silicon Valley just issued a report last week that said only 10% of the entire population of the Bay Area can afford to purchase a house now, down from 25% just a few years ago. So even though we have all this concentration of wealth, we also have this incredible problem on the other end of it, uh, economically, with people who can't really afford to get by. And this is creating a major issue here um, across the board. If you're not part of the tech elite, it becomes very difficult to afford to live here and to have a sustainable lifestyle. So 
um, here's an illustration of just a few, uh, uh, you know, 10 year change. The little, um, you know, uh, dot represents uh, companies that went public uh, that have a billion dollars or more in valuation. So it looks like it goes from just something that's barely visible on the radar screen on the left. By 2015, virtually the entire Bay Area that constitutes Silicon Valley have massive um, growth in companies of, of valuation. So when I say disruptive innovation can transform to real opportunity, I use the Bay Area as one example of that. There are many others. So if you can learn how to actually understand the two worlds and build a bridge, it then becomes possible to have these kinds of economic results you know, for a city, for a geography, for a country, for a, you know, the, um, you know, the world as it would develop. It's gotten even uh, bigger. So we have now over 157 unicorns. Last year we had 100 unicorns. So we now have 157 companies worth over a billion dollars. Now you could argue, is Uber really worth the money that um, it was being valued at? And I would argue probably not. Uh, and maybe they will never even make a profit, we'll see. But they'll be replaced. There'll be other companies that are uh, essentially trying to uh, develop new technologies to win markets. And so uh, this is a continuous process of renewal, wave after wave after wave of technology development. And engineers go from one company to the next company. They transfer their skill set and expertise, learn more information, you know, with the objective of trying to recreate the world in their, uh, kind of in their own image in some cases. So, all right. Are there some case examples that we can also show that aren't Silicon Valley based? And what is the key on the technology side of it? The big thing that is happening now is what I call the convergence of different types of technology. So it's no longer you develop a software product and it works in isolation to solve one particular problem. Now we are taking advanced material sciences, new types of sensors, combining them with new types of materials, creating um, 3D printable wireless antennas, and then taking the data off of it for application on some new type of digital manufacturing application or other type of application. So it's all the combination of these things, the great mixer of technology, this convergence that is actually creating the real value. And as a result of this, we have the ability to connect virtually every person, object, and, and also have the entire environment around them censored. So if we thought it was bad with the iPhone, if we thought our grandchildren were just spending too much screen time, you know, looking at silly stuff on the iPhone. Now, we're essentially a node in a much bigger network. So we can wander through the city with our phone, but at the same time, you'll have sensor technology tracking our movements, cameras and other information, and all of it being integrated, pulled together. That's convergence. So technology also is something that is both good and evil. It has the ability to solve real social problems or create them at the same time. It's really about how we want to think about it as a society, what our ethical standards are, and, and how we want to think about the use of technology, because it could be used for either purpose. It always has been that way. They're tools, like anything else. And so this convergence, however, is moving so rapidly that one of the big challenges is actually keeping up with all the amount of change that's occurring. These are examples. Uh, so the liquid that you see in the vial um, and those little particles that look like sand are actually semiconductors in a liquid that gets sprayed onto a material and then a magnet creates actually a circuit board underneath it, um, drastically reducing the cost of actually putting intelligent processing into new materials. So this whole convergence of advanced materials where you're printing information and combining things where you actually come up with a smart tag like this below, smart tag, um, that allows you to put that on a package and watch it move through the transportation system and tell you whether or not it's been exposed to high temperature variance as it goes along its journey. It has a wireless connector to it so it can communicate you know, with any kind of a network um, to report the information. And it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to manufacture. So IoT sensors now are 80% lower cost than they were five years ago 
Um, and we just invented a new type of technology at Stanford called stretchable materials that will actually bring that down another 60 to 70 percent. Um, so it's pervasive. Um, Dr. Chang has a lab where he has created a new type of sensor that looks like it's in a disc. There are 3,000 sensors in a little disc, They're like a CD or a DVD. I'm really dating myself here. <clears throat> you know, and you can break the disc apart. And then they're connected, each sensor is connected with a uh, like a stringy, springy connector that allows you to stretch it like this and then embed all these sensors into any kind of material, cement, metal, um, clothing, um, waterproof material. And so, and when it connects in, it's ready to report the information. So an 80% cost reduction in his, his technique automatic networking capability, and it can be wrapped around anything and any object and embedded. So he's embedding it in things like batteries to increase the amount of battery capability. He's putting it into clothing for medical applications. He has put it on a wing of an aircraft to detect um, cracks. I wasn't too happy about hearing that. I fly a lot. <clears throat> but instead of taking the plane offline and x-raying it, now the information is continuously connected so that you don't need to do that anymore using his technology. So it saves a lot in terms of servicing cost. So it's disruptive because it changes business models. And it's a brand new wave that is occurring. And it gets combined with other things, other materials, data, and data collection. Um, and here's a great example. So um, this is a solar road project. And um, so solar roads aren't, are, they're not the same as solar panels on roofs. They're more durable, first of all. <laughs> this is in China. And it's part of the development project that the, the government is undertaking to essentially build um, an extensive solar road uh, that will allow uh, people to power their homes uh, and businesses so that every mile of road that you build, you get roughly six, 7,000 homes that can be powered um, with electricity off the grid. But Dr. Chang has a different idea about this. Dr. Chang would like to take his sensors and put them in the road. And then when a truck comes by, you know, like this, read the inventory on the truck as it goes along the road so that um, it's continuously connecting information in transit about the truck. So the truck keeps moving along. Maybe it goes through a desert or a difficult area. And the sensor just reports the information into the road. So the road really is an information highway, <laughs> so to speak. Now think about this. Um, it means that you could have villages, um, or in the United States, you know, uh, small towns in, in the Midwest, um, develop applications for it to program. So if you can push the universities out, you can get people to stay in their location without coming into the cities, as an example and actually develop applications for the road. So it's, a, it's both a new innovation from the point of view of being able to uh, develop new power sources, but it's also um, a social innovation because it can allow us to create job opportunities for people to be able to program applications on the road. So um, transportation companies like UPS and FedEx are very interested in this. Uh, because they would like to find a way to monitor inventory as it goes forward. And remember that smart tag I showed you in the previous slide? The cost of that's coming down to such an extent now that it's possible to, to put this on packaging and have it report the information as it goes through its travel. So um, Dr. Chang is also taking his technology and he's making a robotic hand. So you can wrap this stuff in virtually anything. I mean, I could wrap it around me if I wanted to and I'd be probably a lot smarter than what I am. Uh, at least from a sensing point of view. Um, and he's doing the robotic hand because what he wants to have happen is he wants the robot, independent of human interaction, to sense its environment and make decisions. So I go on a table and my robotic hand starts approaching a cup of coffee. Now here's the key part of it. It's connected to machine intelligence, artificial intelligence. So when it approaches the cup of coffee, it says to itself, this is a cup of coffee. If I do this, it's going to pour hot liquid 
and harm humans. If I keep it straight, I have to handle it this way if I'm going to move it. And by the way, I can't crush the cup, it's ceramic. So the idea here is to allow the sensors to create independent ability to sense an environment. To do that, he needs computing power, he needs storage, all those five things we talked about in that quantum platform previously. And if he can actually accomplish it, he can do virtually anything from medical procedures to being able to pick strawberries in a, in a field, uh, or for that matter, be able to manage a lot of other um, possibilities. So I'm gonna move a little bit quicker. This is an application to be able to build a medical shirt um, that allows a patient to leave the hospital and have it connect up at home through the shirt. It can detect um, uh, uh, major, major issues around health. Uh, this is everything connected. As an example of that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about BMW. Okay, uh, so I, um, I have an i3, so I'm a BMW fan, and I also have a relationship with some of the executives in Munich, uh, left over from Microsoft days. So one day I'm on University Avenue, um, and in the usual mess, traveling at three miles an hour, and Ram sends me a text message. And I look at my text message uh, for about a second, and bam, I'm in a major collision at three miles an hour to the car in front of me. And so I get out of the car, no damage, I could see. You know, everything looked fine, took pictures. And I thought to myself, eh, no big deal. So I continue my journey. That night, I get a text message from BMW. And the text message says to me, you had a 3.7 mile collision, and you incurred hairline cracks. If you'd like to actually have them repaired, your proposal will be ready for you at the dealership the next day. $1,581 worth of so-called damage. <clears throat> so my wife, who's really smart, says to me, the very first question she asks is, that data stay with the car? In other words, if you don't repair it, now I've got to worry about it, when, and the answer is yes, it does. So that if I don't repair it, the information now stays with the history of the car. Under California law, you have to be able to disclose this stuff. And so I've got a real problem on my hands. So I called up my friend and said, and he said to me on the phone, how did you like our new beta test program? <laughs> and I said, I uh, wasn't really joking. Uh, you, this is a beta test program? This is not for real? He said, yeah, you're, you're our guinea pig. But we're going to roll this out across all the BMW lines within the next year to 18 months. I said, really? So essentially what they've done is when you're in the car, everything is monitored. How I drive um, and also how the car's performing. So if it does get in a collision, it actually can tell BMW manufacturing instantly how parts in the car perform. So instead of guessing what a manufacturer spec is, it can now have data to show the manufacturer it didn't perform up to spec, you need to change it or we need to reduce cost. So the beta test showed about a 20% improvement in operating cost just from this continuous connection. And the other part of it is, is that the dealers out at the service level now have direct connect to be able to have um, a proposal ready. Um, and so the information that's gathered is, is parceled out to whoever is appropriate virtually instantly. So as we start thinking about continuous connected change, Amazon's working on a project, you walk, you flash um, up to a turnstile, your app, and then you walk in and there's sensors everywhere and you don't go to a cashier, you just pick up what you want and walk out. So there's no longer cashiers available to help you with goods and services. So that's again, convergence. All these different types of technologies combining to basically create a new model. Uh, interestingly enough, 40% reduction in cost, operating costs for retail that Amazon did with 12 of these stores. In fact, it created such a stir that the city governments like Seattle started getting involved to see because they were worried about losing jobs um, you know, because of it. So uh, since time, uh, one of the most uh, valuable companies is also combining information uh, across different social media sites and also hooking it up with cameras. Um, now, the last thing I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about um, the impact of all this for us as we start thinking about cities. Uh, it's now about how the data gets collected 
what the insights are as a result of the algorithm development and then what we do with it. And we have now more of this capability than we've ever had before with not so much in the way of being able to use expertise to figure out what to do with it. So the principal challenge for everybody, including governments, is actually understanding the implications of all this. Uh, for the U.S. government, it's about privacy um, or lack thereof. You know, uh, for corporations like Facebook, it's about how do we get even more information and profile data to drive our profits. And so uh, this is the world in which we live. And it's going to be even more increasingly difficult uh, to figure out how to manage this as things go on because there's so much in terms of advances crossing so many different areas that it's literally an excedrin headache. Uh, excedrin is an aspirin that, that helps with uh, migraines and so I have a big thing of this in my, um, in my drawer. But what we're seeing at Stanford is 417 technology labs here just at this school, 10 projects on average each and you could start counting 300 spinoffs out of Stanford every couple of years, 300 startup companies. What we haven't done is connecting it up to corporations, existing companies, to help them, and that's what our program does. So what we do is we connect the, the dots between all the technology and what it involves, um, and this goes on and talks about other things, but that's the end of the presentation. And what we are, are really trying to do is also focus on um, the existing markets and helping them understand where disruption is headed. And so we have this visual modeling project that I talked about and that's one of the key aspects of all this because we have cooperation among the various players to figure out how to take different information like financial, um, real estate, and then combine it to see what insights we can, we can develop. So I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop here. Mm -hmm.